So how do, do the gallbladder, the pancreas, how do they know when is the right moment to add what they have into the duodenum? How do they know that? Well, the answer is, it's the duodenum that is going to tell the gallbladder and the pancreas, hey guys, food just arrived. I, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to lose weight by eating more slowly. Um, it's a good technique for losing weight. And one of the reasons is that it takes a while before your body knows that you've eaten. And why is that? I know that probably all of you and most of the world are under the impression that our body knows we've eaten when food hits our stomach, right? But that's not true. You can have quite a lot of food in your stomach and your brain doesn't yet know, doesn't really feel like you've eaten. So how does your brain know? Well, some of those ways are actually relatively complicated, but one of the interesting ways has to do with this particular enzyme, sorry, hormone known as cholecystokinin. That's what that long word is, cholecystokinin, abbreviated CCK for, I guess, obvious reasons. Cholecystokinin is a hormone that is released from the duodenum when uh, acid mixed with triglycerides arrives in the duodenum. That will tell the duodenum, oh, wow, we just ate. And then it will send out this hormone, cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin will um, find target cells in the pancreas, and those target cells will squeeze and send in bicarbonate and uh, digestive enzymes into the duodenum. And when the cholecystokinin reaches the um, gallbladder, the gallbladder smooth muscle will squeeze and send a squeeze of that ultra concentrated bile into the duodenum. So cholecystokinin is also one of the hormones that when it arrives in your brain, your brain will know that you've been fed, right? Now, um, there are other hormones that are released. Uh, secretin is another hormone uh, that is released from the duodenum and it'll cause the uh, duodenum itself and the pancreas to put more bicarbonate into the duodenum. Uh, the stomach releases something called gastrin. The duodenum also uh, releases gastrin. That doesn't make sense, does it? But I guess they named it when they found it in the stomach. Um, but I, I think let's focus on cholecystokinin. So two things about cholecystokinin. One thing is, uh, we think that it's cholecystokinin or perhaps other molecules being released by the duodenum that finally tell your brain that you've been fed. And this is why if you ever tried to crash diet and do something like, I'm gonna eat nothing but watermelon, you actually eat quite a bit of sugar, you eat a big volume of food, but you don't feel like you've been fed. And that's partly because these hormones don't get released from the duodenum in response to the arrival of watermelon juice in the duodenum. That's one thing. It's one of the reasons why it's only about 15 minutes into uh, your meal when you start to really feel like, oh, okay, I've been fed now. I've got something to digest. It takes a little while. Um, that delay comes from the fact that it's not until the stomach has finished enough stuff to move into uh, the duodenum that you get the message. This is also what we think is one of the reasons why the modern American diet is, um, is really bad for body weight. Um, why? Because um, many of the foods that we eat in the modern American diet are foods that can be eaten very, very quickly. So I'd like you for a moment to compare two meals. Imagine they are in front of you. One is going to be a New York steak with a baked potato. And you can actually get a pretty good sized New York steak and a baked potato with some butter on it. And you can do that easily for 500 calories. And then over here on the right, we're gonna just put a Big Mac, okay? A Big Mac with all kinds of trimmings as well, a double Mac is probably gonna be 500 calories, all right? Now, ready, set, go, go ahead and eat. <laughs> Well, the Big Mac, you know it'll take you 15 minutes. I mean, at the most, right? You can probably wolf one down a lot faster than that. But with the steak and the baked potato, you got to go with the fork, with the knife. 
with the steak, you gotta bite, chew, 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 chew. It'll take a little while. So because of the nature of the foods we have a tendency to eat now are things that can be eaten really quickly, we can consume a whole bunch of calories before that very first bite of food starts to register with your brain that you've been fed. So one of the other tricks for um, weight loss is to eat food that you have to sit and eat with a fork and knife. And believe it or not, if you just switch from hamburgers to pieces of steak that you had to cut with a knife and fork, that by itself can help you eat a lot less. The other thing is the arrival of a sugary beverage like watermelon juice, right? Um, it doesn't stimulate this at all. So you could drink uh, 500 calories in a double gulp of Coke. You don't feel less hungry at all. You certainly don't feel full. And you just had 500 calories. That's another reason why it's just what we eat as Americans, not just Americans, pretty much most of the world now is one of the things that's leading us to be fat because it, it short circuits this normal system. I am actually going to try to turn off my picture because I cannot, I cannot keep it from lagging. All righty, so let's talk a little bit more about the small intestine. So the small intestine's got three regions. This first part, super short, gets its own name, now you know why. So much important stuff happens there at the duodenum. Second part is called the jejunum. Believe it or not, by the time whatever you ate has gone through that second part, the jejunum, almost all of the digestion and absorption has been accomplished. It's interesting because the ileum is actually the longest part of the small intestine. And yet the ileum is just, you know, picking up a few extra calories here and there from every meal. Uh, the duodenum and the jejunum um, are doing almost all of the digesting and absorbing. All right, so remember DJ Ilium, the world's darkiest DJ? Uh, the duodenum is going to neutralize the stomach acids. We now know that it also releases uh, hormones that, that command the pancreas and the gallbladder to send in their secretions. It opens up the sphincter between the pancreas and uh, the duodenum. Uh, it, it by itself um, puts in all kinds of bicarbonate. So much stuff happens in the duodenum. The jejunum is the next eight feet. Um, most of the digestion and absorption happens there. The last 12 feet, I'm not gonna say it's not important. If you have these 12 feet of your intestinal tract removed, you will notice a difference in your health. Um, but it does some stuff that we're not entirely sure about. There are more bacteria living here than in the rest of the small intestine. It has these areas that are called Peyer's patches, little clusters of those lymphatic nodules. It may play an important role in our immune system. Uh, so probably we're going to learn a lot more about the ileum in the next uh, decade or so. Right. Let's think a little bit more about the um, tissue structure of the wall of the small intestine. In 150, you probably looked at um, uh, this, that heavy plaster model that had the finger-like projections uh, for the villi. This is what we're thinking about, right? The villi are the finger-like projections. They're only about a millimeter tall, but you can see them with a small amount of magnification. They contain capillaries that we now know are going to receive the carbohydrate and protein once it's been digested into monomers. And it, those villi also contain, each one has a lacteal, and the lacteal is going to be given the lipid and lipid soluble vitamins that have been absorbed. The microvilli are super small. So these are the villi, right? And the villi um, are there to make a greater surface area. Um, the only way any molecule of anything that you ate is going to be absorbed is if it happens to bump into the cell membrane of one of these many cells, right? Um, the reason we've got these uh, villi is in that little, little circle area 
where the villus attaches to the wall of the intestinal tract, how many cells could you put there as a flat row compared to how many can you put there when it's shaped like a villus? Shaped like a villus, you can easily put 100 times as much cell membrane, and that is 100 times as much nutrient as you can absorb from your meal um, in that segment of your intestinal tract. So we're all about expanding surface area. But now if you zoom in, oh, I love this image. Okay, so here we've got what the inside of the jejunum looks like. If, you've got, if you're looking down there with one of those fiber optic endoscopes, with one of those fiber optic endoscopes and you're looking around, you're seeing if there's cancer or anything like that. Do you see, do you see this sort of uh, velvety, almost carpet looking appearance? You're looking at villi, right? But now what about microvilli? So if I took one of those cells and blew it up so it looks like that, hey, look, it's got little tiny villi on the surface of the single cell. Those are the microvilli. So villi and microvilli, not the same things. Uh, the microvilli comprise the brush border. Remember brush border? The brush border enzymes like enterokinase are found attached to those microvilli. So other uh, digestive enzymes are just flowing around inside of, you know, somewhere inside of here. But enterokinase and other brush border enzymes are attached right to the microvilli on the villi in the intestinal tract. What other brush border enzymes are there? You know, the brush border enzymes are mostly the enzymes that are responsible for kind of like the last step in digestion before absorption. So, uh, enzymes like sucrase and lactase and maltase, they are also brush border enzymes. Sucrase is going to take the disaccharide, that is table sugar, sucrose, and split it in half, and those two pieces immediately get sucked into the cell. Um, uh, lactase is going to take the disaccharide lactose and split it in half and absorb it. Um, and maltase splits the disaccharide maltose. So those are other examples of brush border enzymes. By the way, about 75% of the population of planet Earth um, should be considered lactose intolerant. Um, it is actually not normal for a mammal, and we are that category of animal on planet Earth. It's not normal for mammals to keep on making the brush border enzyme lactase into our adulthood. Why? Because if you are a mammal, a typical mammal, you are only even consuming lactose as long as you are uh, nursing on your mom. So usually by the time a kid turns six or seven or so, he's not making lactase anymore because evolution expects he's not drinking milk anymore. Um, there was a gene mutation in Northern Europeans uh, that allowed that lactase to continue being made uh, during a, life, a lifespan. And now that particular enzyme is found in many, many, many populations, but it's much more commonly found in people of Northern European descent or the Inuit or the, let me see if I get it right, the Watusi in Africa, because these were groups of people that, um, that domesticating milk producing animals like goats and cattle and such um, is a part of the nutrition of the culture. All right, we're going to pick up here at our next video.